evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. You should be coming in muted. And uh, we are going to do some, wait for everybody to join. I'll do some quick housekeeping and, and share about the program with everybody and how tonight's presentation will work. Um, we do ask that you remain muted throughout. Uh, and that's typically, that's strictly just for feedback issues. Um, people might have uh, done their, with their cameras. So we're going to continue to keep everybody muted. Um, we'll have a chance for questions and I'll jump into the um, format of our, mute, of our meeting in just a few minutes as people are coming in. Um, so everyone was very quick to, to come in early. That was great. Here's our lobby. Okay. Um, let's see. So it looks like we have everybody in. I am going to go ahead and start and do a quick um, housekeeping and a quick just run through of the program for today. And then um, I'm going to pass it off to our friends at Texas AgriLife and the Houston Master Gardeners um, to take over. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Brian Craddish. I am with the Harris County Public Library and I am at the administration library, actually, the administration branch. Um, it's been a very strange start to the summer for our summer reading program, as I'm sure everybody is aware. Uh, we quickly realized that we we're gonna have to go all online. So we are very, very grateful to all of our presenters for helping us um, in these kind of strange presenting ways. And I'm very grateful for all of you for joining us virtually um, and for making our program just so fantastic. Um, for our program today, it is gonna be a lecture style. <clears throat> so we ask that you leave your cameras off and remain muted throughout. I will continue to mute people if I see anybody who unmutes by accident, that's fine. Um, we're only muting for feedback issues. There is a conversation panel. It says show conversation on the main menu. I'm gonna type in hello. I encourage everybody to try a quick hello, make sure that it's working. That's how we're gonna ask all of our questions for our presenters today. Um, it just works a lot easier sound-wise if we really limit the number of people speaking. Um, so please type in questions throughout. Um, I encourage everybody to sign up for the summer reading program, including grown-ups, so adults can also participate. Uh, and with the summer reading program, it is read books, earn points, and we do have books to win. Our libraries are also now open for curbside services. So please visit our libraries um, to get some materials. Call your local branch for information on how their curbside is going. And with that, I have talked more than long enough <laughs> about everything else besides plants. I'd like to welcome Candy, who is with Texas A&M AgriLife and the Houston Master Gardeners. And today we are talking about lawns and alternatives. And I'm going to pass it away. Candy. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. It's really an opp great opportunity to be here and happy to um, to be a part of this program um, as a part of um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Harris County Master Gardener. It's a real delight to be here. Um, we're gonna be um, spending a little bit of time today, as he said, talking about lawn and lawn alternatives. And um, one of the things that I want to um, Okay, hang on guys, trying to change pages. All right, got it. Um, so one of the things I wanted to show you was that this is actually a part of a much larger series. If you're familiar at all with the Green Thumb Gardening Series, you'll know that these were slated to be um, conducted in the libraries. And so we are very, very thankful that the library, we wanna thank Brian um, and Jennifer Schwartz as well for um, co-hosting this event with us. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to uh, Paul Winsky's here. He is our um, AgriLife Extension agent. And then we have Brandy Keller as well here, who is going to be helping us field questions. So we appreciate the, the time that you've spent um, in being part of this. And um, let's just jump right in. So we're going to be talking about lawns today. And um, I think it's just really interesting that if you're a part of this uh, program today, you're probably in one of three categories. Either A, you're a brand new gardener um, and 
and possibly a brand new homeowner. And you'll know the first thing you're going to purchase when you get a new home is a lawnmower. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you might be here. Another one is you may be a very seasoned gardener, but you may have some specific questions or some issues that you're having in your lawn or turf that you would like to um, learn about today. Um, or you may be just new to the area. Maybe you're a seasoned gardener, but you've come from the Midwest or the Northeast. And you will quickly find that um, gardening here is going to be very different. So let's just dive right in. We've set this presentation up to really answer the top eight questions. Um, as master gardeners, we um, are often in public spaces um, as, as a group, and we're often asked questions about turf. And so we've sort of boiled it down to about eight basic questions, um, and we're going to zip through those um, tonight. Um, I will tell you as a reminder, when you do have questions for me or someone else um, on the panel, please just type them into the chat line and we'll stop every now and then and see if we have any questions. So let's get started. The first question we always get asked is, which grass is the best for the Houston area? Well, obviously we live in a very warm climate and so we're gonna be limited to really three um, very suitable alternatives for grasses. Those are warm season turf grasses and you'll see in the little um, Texas uh, map there um, that these grasses are suitable for these areas, particularly the St. Augustine grass. So let's talk about them quickly. Um, Bermuda grass um, is one of those turf grasses and I can already hear some of you guys groaning in the background because some of us actually treat Bermuda grass as a weed. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but certainly we, um, and I've lost my presentation. Yeah, we lost the presentation somehow. Uh, <laughs> Did we click out of it by accident? I don't think so. Huh. Well, I don't know. Go ahead and try to share it again, and we'll bring this back? back up. Uh, let's see. Yep, we're back. Perfect. All right, perfect. Sorry about that, guys. So Bermuda grass is one of those that, um, that some of us treat as weed, but it's also a very suitable alternative for our area. And really, it's used a lot on golf courses. So if you spend much time on the greens and the fairways, you'll see Bermuda grass. Another one is zoysia grass. Um, it's one that's not nearly as common, but it's been around for quite some time, and it has some really good benefits that we'll talk about as well. Finally, it's St. Augustine, which is really the most common. And if I were in a live presentation, I would be asking for a show of hands of who has St. Augustine grass in their yard, because more than likely, that is the turf that you have um, in your yard. So um, the thing about the St. Augustine grass is that um, it has a wonderful feel to it. Um, it has a very large blade, and so it feels good under your feet. It's cool. Um, in fact, it's nice to, to walk out barefooted during the summer under a tree, and that St. Augustine grass can be quite cool. Um, I find the Bermuda grass to be a little wiry. It has a much thinner leaf blade, and so uh, for me personally, not as desirable, but it's got some great attributes as well. The zoysia is kind of the middle of the road. And so if you look here at our um, table of comparisons, you'll see that each one of them has some great attributes and some of them we're going to have to compromise on. Primarily, um, when we look at the tolerances for these three grasses, you're going to see that St. Augustine is a mixed bag. When it comes to shade, it's better than the other two with regards to shade. Now, I will tell you this, if it's dense, dark shade, like in the corner of a backyard where you have fence and you have hedge and you have trees, um, it will be difficult to grow any type of grass, but for the general high profile underneath pine trees or underneath oak trees, uh, St. Augustine does very well. You'll see Bermuda grass, not so much. It wants to be in the hot sun. Um, zoysia, sort of middle of the road. As far as drought conditions, it says here that St. Augustine is good, uh, while the other two are very good. And I think that has to do a lot with the shape of the leaf blade. If you think about that wide leaf blade, there's going to be a lot of water um, respiration taking place in that leaf blade. And so when we have those really drought conditions, it's going to lose a considerable amount of water. And with that being the case, maybe not so great as the meter and zoysia, but certainly um, a good alternative. As far as traffic is concerned, St. <laughs> Augustine doesn't do too well with traffic. 
Um, and I will tell you this little story. Um, between the houses where I live, uh, where there's a lot of traffic because you're going back and forth to the fence gates, you're going uh, running a lawnmower back and forth, you're bringing your garbage cans back and forth. I have a patch about three feet out from our gate. And St. Augustine will just not grow there. It's too compacted in that spot. Um, too much sun in that spot and lead to much traffic. So I have a little patch of Bermuda that grows there. And believe me, I tried to fight it, you know, like everyone else does, but um, I finally let it grow. So when you look down that alleyway, you'll see three quarters of the way is beautiful green Bermuda, I mean, uh, St. Augustine grass. And then you'll see a little patch of Bermuda right at the gate. So just understand that, that St. Augustine is not gonna be great uh, where you have high traffic areas. So if you have dogs that run around your backyard, you're going to have difficulty with keeping those areas nice and green. As far as cold tolerance, we don't have terribly cold winters here. Um, again, the St. Augustine, St. Augustine has the lowest tolerance for the cold. And again, I believe it's because of that wide leaf blade uh, where that cold, dry air blows in and really can zap the, the turf quite quickly. As far as for disease resistance, um, we see that St. Augustine was actually one of the highest, and that's good news for us. There's only a few critters and a few um, fun fungus that really can attack um, the St. Augustine grass, but those are very manageable. And so the question is, um, St. Augustine and Bermuda have some highs and lows, but you see the zoysia really comes in pretty much mid-range, the very good to high, in all those categories. And the question always is asked, well, why don't we just use zoysia? Now, there's really two answers to that question. Um, the first one is expense. Um, if you look at a pallet of um, St. Augustine, you're looking at about $300 a pallet. Zoysia can be more like $275, $375 to $400 a pallet. So it's significantly more expensive. It also is a slow grower. So if you want to go a least expensive route and try to do plugs in your yard instead of laying down full sod, it will take a lot longer for that zoysia to really produce a, a nice dense carpet for you. So typically, um, while it does very well here, it seems like the grass of choice is still going to be the Bermuda grass. So my question to you is this, can you tell the difference? So we have three photographs here, A, B, and C. Um, and they're the three grasses we just talked about. So what do you think A is? Well, you're right, St. Augustine. Um, you can see that white leaf blade. You can see that beautiful green color that we all love in, in, um, in that grass. What do you think B is? Yep, if you guessed Bermuda grass, you guessed right. Um, so you can see from that photograph, it's a lot more wiry, um, a little thinner blade. But again, it's a very, very strong plant. So believe me, if you've ever tried to pull up um, a runner of Bermuda grass, you'll know how difficult it is. So you can see the intensity and the strength of the Bermuda grass. And that's why it's often used um, on golf courses or places with high traffic. Okay, so by process of elimination, we have C is the zoysia grass. And you can clearly see there that it's a, a little greener grass than the Bermuda. Uh, but still has that relatively small leaf blade, um, but does quite well here. I only know a couple people who have ever tried it, uh, my father-in-law being one, and he liked it um, fairly well. So, All right, number two question, when and how high should I mow my lawn? Boy, mowing the lawn is getting to be tough these days. <laughs> um, it's starting to get very hot. In fact, I was looking at the thermometer while ago, it nearly hit 101 today in Katy. So, um, I get it. It's um, get, getting to be hot to take care of the lawn. So the joke here is whenever he's hungry and as far as he can reach. So thankfully, we don't have to rely on animals, goats or sheep to keep our lawns um, trimmed. We have wonderful lawn mowing equipment. And in fact, recently we've just switched everything over to um, battery operated. So all of our lawn equipment is battery operated. Um, but like I said, as a homeowner, one of the first things you're going to buy is a lawnmower. So how often and how um, high do we cut the grasses? Really for all three of these, I'm sorry to say, it's gonna be once a week, particularly during the growing season. And we'll see a slide later that'll sh short, sort of show us exactly what that growing season is. But you know the growing season as it gets into March, April, May, you're mowing 
uh, right now every week. Now, when it gets into the very hot part of the season, you might back off to eight or nine days um, as opposed to seven days, but we want to do it probably at least once a week. As far as the height, this is pretty important. The Bermuda and the Zoysia grass can really handle a much shorter cut. And that's really beneficial, again, in those high turf areas, you'd like that nice, neat, um, short cut. The St. Augustine grass, not so much. Um, it really likes to have a fair amount of leaf blade. And so you want to keep that cut anywhere from two and a half to three inches. And I really encourage you, um, as we get now into these hot, dry days and months, that you raise the mower to the full three inches. I think that's really the most beneficial for St. Augustine. All right, do we have any questions, Brandy? Uh, no, not right now. Uh, we're still, I think we're still trying to work out everybody get having the chat option and everything. So, so we're good for right now. All right, well, just keep getting those questions in as much as you can, and I will continue going. All right, number three, when and how much do I need to water my lawn? So water is a big, is a big concern, a big issue sometimes. Um, we want to be as conservative as we can with our, um, with our water, but we want to have a beautiful yard. I mean, let's face it. Um, the American obsession with lawns <laughs> is that it'd be great. It's a showpiece. It's a little competition for the neighborhood. Um, it proves what a great gardener you are. And so, and it also increases your, the value of your property. So um, keeping it nice and keeping it healthy is really important. So you really have to balance the water conservation with what your expectations are. And so let's talk about expectations for a minute. Um, you may be perfectly satisfied with just keeping it alive, and that is quite all right. You know, everyone knows how hot it gets here, and unless you're in a serious competition or unless you just let it go completely ratty, um, it's quite okay to have a little yellow during the summer. I mean, it gets hot. We understand that, but if you can tolerate that, then certainly cut back your, your watering to meet your needs. If you want um, to compromise, then you could do sort of a medium setting where you got maybe a little lightening of that turf, um, but still quite healthy. Or you can go full bore and get the brightest greenish you can possibly get all year. But I tell you, that's really um, that really borderlines on being not very water efficient. Plus, really, when it gets hot, the grass is going to need a little break from from all that water. Um, so you don't want to overwater. I will tell you this, underwatering is just as bad as overwatering. Overwatering can cause all kinds of problems and diseases to set in, and underwatering of, watering, of course, can weaken the, the turf as well. So really, you want to choose the watering level that meets your personal expectations. Now, the typical um, rule of thumb, if you will, is about one inch per week during the summer. Um, now, I say during the summer because you don't want to uh, water in the wintertime or you want to keep it as low as possible in the wintertime. But during the summer months, about one inch per week. Let me say it again, one inch per week. That's not one inch per day. Um, so you want to understand what kind of watering your system gives you. If you have an automatic watering system, then you need to understand, is it giving it a week, an inch a day, or is it giving it an inch a week? So take precautions on managing your watering system. Um, and like it says at the bottom, very often you wind up with um, too much water in the lawn, and that can be a real problem too. So let's look at how do we water. <clears throat> well, we want to water the most efficiently um, as possible. We want to water deeper, but less frequently. So what I mean by deeper watering is I don't mean throwing a lot of water. We have a pretty, pretty solid cap of clay underneath most of our lawns. And when you just dump a lot of water on the lawn, what happens? It runs into the street, which is not what we want, want to happen. So what we want is to water deeper. We're trying to get four to six inches of, of wetness if you will, in the soil. You want that water to permeate about four to six inches, and that's not gonna be very easy with the underlay of clay that we have under our turf. 
So the way to do that is maybe cycling the watering. So you might want to water, if you're going to water, let's say uh, three minutes on a given day, you might want to water a minute, then wait a couple of hours and water another minute, and then wait a couple of hours and water another minute. That gives it more time to permeate through the soil and to get deeper. As you see in the slide there, the deeper the root system, the taller the sprout. Typically it's about the same height, the depth of the root and the, and the height of the shoot. So um, you want to make sure you water deep. You also want to um, look at those stressful high heat times and adjust your watering. So we've been gone the last four days and this dry high pressure system has moved into our area. And I promise you, I was a bit surprised when I stepped out of the car and, and stepped off into the lawn and I heard a crunch. I mean, I will be honest with you, we didn't anticipate these last four or five really dry days with low humidity. And so I'm seeing some stress on the water. So we've already made the adjustments to watering a little bit more often in the day. So break it up into smaller segments, um, but not necessarily a lot more water. We just want to make it um, efficient as possible. Also, you want to do early morning better than high noon because you don't want it to all evaporate away or cause any burning or, or issues with the grass itself. Um, if you do have a, an automatic system, be sure you install rain sensors. It's so frustrating to, to be out on a nice rainy day and just see the sprinklers going like crazy. Um, that's really a waste of our groundwater and we want to make sure that we conserve that as much as possible. Also, you want to make sure to check um, the installation of the heads. Often go through and physically watch every zone in your system to make sure that it's properly watering and not spraying the street or the sidewalk or uh, someplace that you don't want it to, um, to spray. Also, you want to make sure it's not flooding an area as well, because when you get to diseases, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I also want to show you that um, <clears throat> The growth season here is from early spring until uh, late fall. Understand that early spring here is February. It's not March or April like it is in the Midwest. It's February. So, but you can see though that you want in those winter months that will be like November, December, January, maybe early February um, to reduce or completely shut off your watering. All right, we got the questions um, set up yet? Uh, yeah, they're they're starting to come in. I think we're getting everybody on the same page. I do want to mention if you're having trouble seeing the chat that what the solution that seems to have worked is to uh, restart your browser or the Teams app. Uh, as far as a question, the first one that I see says, can I kill St. Augustine if I don't water in the summer? I would say if you didn't water it at all in the summer, it's going to struggle to come back. So I have seen patches in the yard where um, it seemed to be almost totally brown, similar to what you're seeing in the picture now. Um, but if there's any um, if there's any viable root left, it will come back up. But you absolutely could kill it if you just completely did not water the entire season. OK, and can you mix grass types? Grass types? I would say, and, and maybe Paul or someone else who's a turf expert can answer this better, but I would say if you try to do mixed grass types, you're going to, unless you, so if you're looking for a clean boundary between the two of them, it's not going to happen because you're always going to have one that's going to be growing more aggressively than the other. So there'll be a blended area if you're trying to, um, to, to mix grasses. Um, but one will typically outshine the other in certain places of the yard, just like in my yard. Where there's high traffic, the Bermuda's going to win. Where there's low traffic, the St. Augustine may win. Um, Paul, you on? Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I just posted. Is. Sometimes the sod will have a mix. Uh, it's predominantly St. Augustine, but there's always a little bit of Bermuda in it. So, uh, and like you said, it, it's just going to depend on where it is. Um, if you cut it high and manage it, towards a um, St. Augustine lawn, then the St. Augustine will outgrow the Bermuda and you'll have a predominantly St. Augustine lawn. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of that has to do with shade. Um, if you keep that St. Augustine higher, then it will actually shade off uh, the Bermuda grass. If you kept the St. Augustine too, too short, then uh, believe me, the Bermuda grass will encroach. And then so you never can really have a clean line unless you put in a hard scape, some kind of hard um, uh, border to separate the two. Anything else? Um, there are a few more, but uh, I think just in this for the sake of time, we can go ahead and move forward and then we can come back to those. Excellent. All right. So we'll, we'll just talk a little bit about fertilizers. Um, <clears throat> the two pictures you see there on their slide are um, too much fertilizer, too little fertilizer. And I'm sure you can probably tell the difference. The one on the left, obviously, is too much fertilizer. Um, too much fertilizer, particularly ones that are salt based and not necessarily organic, um, are going to um, could have the possibility of really burning your lawn. And you can almost see the lawn, the pattern that the person walked. They must have been sewing it by hand. And you could actually see the pattern where the person was walking through the yard and really, really did burn that lawn. The good news about Bermuda is um, with a, a good bit of water um, to dilute some of that salt out and uh, cleaning up that area, it will grow fast and fill back in. But it's quite unsightly and very frustrating if that happens to you. Um, the too little will just cause a weakened lawn. Um, you see there it's just really thin. Um, it's um, not as green and lush as it could be. Um, when you look at the chemistry, we're not going to get into all this, but ideally you'd like to have a mix of 312, um, for example, 15510. Um, you can go to your local nurseryman. Um, also, the AgriLife website has all kinds of recommendations for fertilizers for our area, for the St. Augustine and the other grasses. I do want to mention grass clippings. So the first mow of the year for us, we typically bag um, the debris because it's basically going to be oak leaf debris and twigs and things like that. Those then get transferred to the backyard where we do not have a lawn turf, but we have mulched in backyard. And so it gets transferred back there to produce the, the backyard covering. Um, but then from then on, we mulch in the grass cuttings. So we do not bag them because obviously the grass itself, guess what, has the same ratio of the nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium that the, that the grass needs. So it makes for a perfect um, organic um, fertilizer. You want to apply them early in the spring and fall. And like I said, February and October are the typical dates that we use for um, for doing those. And then it says that you can have some enhanced light summer applications, but I really would caution you um, if you're going to do that to use something that's more slow release. Um, so an organic type uh, fertilizer that might be slow release would be maybe a better alternative, particularly like right now where it's very hot and very dry outside. All right, the other question that always comes up is weeds, weeds, weeds. How do we control weeds? Well, like we said with the Bermuda grass, is it a weed or is it a grass? So you never know. One man's weed is another man's wildflower. We typically fight two kinds of weeds. Uh, the grassy weeds, which uh, crab grass, Johnson grass, uh, Bermuda grass, I, yes, it's like what? Some of us tend to think Bermuda grass is a weed if we want that beautiful um, St. Augustine turf. Um, then we also have broadleaf um, weeds like dollar weed and dandelions. And the way we fight those is really two ways. Um, if they're weeds that come up from seeds, a uh, pre-emergence herbicide is the best thing to use. Um, and that can be done early, again, early in the um, spring. And if you want to, again, late in the fall to catch anything that might be trying to germinate. Um, the other one that we have that are perennials, uh, we would do spot treatments. And literally just get down there um, close into it and just apply very little bit of a spot treatment onto the plants that you want them to um, that you want to kill. But I will tell you this, and I'm going to say this over and over, the best control of anything for weeds or um, or or any kind of pest is a healthy lawn. So if you do the right things to maintain your lawn, then you should not have serious problems with weeds. Do we all have them? Yes. I have some, for some reason, violets have just popped up everywhere in our, in our um, turf. And it's because I brought them in from exchanging plants with someone else. 
So just know that even though we're fighting uh, this COVID virus, we're also sometimes fighting with weeds that may um, enter unsuspectingly into our, into our gardens, into our lawns. And by the way, bees love dandelions. Just a little thought. All right, what about critters? Well, thankfully, um, we only really have two that we worry too much about, um, chinch bugs and grub worms. Um, the chinch bug is pretty classic here. If you have had a lawn for any period of time in the Houston area, you've had chinch bug damage. Um, it's, it's that little small bug you see in the photograph, and then off to the right, you see the damage that it causes. The thing about chinch bugs is it really likes the hot and dry. So I would start being concerned about them coming up in the next few weeks. Um, they like it very hot and consequently they tend to migrate um, closer to where you have hardscape that heats up. So you see in the picture that looks like maybe next to a sidewalk, along your driveway, near any rocks that you may have used for borders in your yard, any place where it gets exceptionally hot and potentially exceptionally dry uh, will be the trench chinch bug damage. And you can see it's very regular. A lot of times if it's widespread, weeds will even pop up where the grass was. Um, but you can actually see the chinch bugs if you get down there and dig closely into the um, top of the soil, you can, um, or right into the, the mat, you can see the chinch bugs. Um, grubs are the other ones, and they're actually the larva of our gene bug. And so, you know, the June bugs have just been just been out uh, the last few weeks. And so um, that is the larva for the June bug. Now, understand that the June bug, that's it's that's part of its life cycle. Part of its life cycle is to be under the turf and part of its life cycle is to eat. You know, the the hungry caterpillar story, the caterpillar is going to eat, eat, eat. That's its whole purpose. And what does it eat? It eats the roots of the grass. So um, if you have a large infestation of grubs, um, then you might want to do something about that. If you have large patches of damage or you dig down and you see a significant number of them in, a, in an area, then you might want to do treatment for them. But really, um, that's what grubs do. And again, if you have a healthy lawn, you have enough lawn to enjoy and maybe to share with the grubs as well. Just remember that when you're going to use any kind of chemical pesticides on these, and there are some great um, uh, varieties out there, um, that more is not always better. So be real cautious when you're using any kind of uh, herbicide or pesticide on your lawn, even fertilizers, use them according to the label directions. Now we'll caution you that sometimes the label directions are very broad. Um, I know in the case of a weed and feed we tried to use a few years ago, it was a very broad, um, uh, for a broad reaching area and we overdid it and caused a little bit of problem um, with burning. But just be careful if you use any chemical fertilizers in your yard or any um, pesticides or herbicides to so follow the instructions. Um, any questions? Uh, not really. Um, there haven't been many, but uh, Paul and I have been posting a lot of fact sheets and uh, A&M AgriLife links. So. Uh, definitely go back and check out some of those. You can go ahead and click on them and then they'll end up in your browser, browser so you'll have them later. Yeah, that's very good. And I, I just want to stress to you guys, I mean, I know a lot of you are probably already uh, familiar with the AgriLife Extension Service, but please um, take those links with you. Um, they really just have a host of information. Um, you know, when you originally set this program up, we could have, I could have talked two hours about the subject of turf, but, um, but there is a host of information out there on those links, so please take advantage of that. All right, number seven, we're moving right along. How do I manage diseases? Well, the good news is that St. Augustine is not terribly susceptible to too many diseases, but the ones that we do have can produce um, a significant amount of damage. So um, the three that I've listed here are all fungal in nature. Um, but again, remember that a properly managed yard is going to be much less susceptible to these diseases than others. So probably one of the most common is ground patch. Uh, there's another um, similar fungi, uh, fungal uh, disease called large patch. Um, and they pr produce that classic circular um, pattern in your yard. You see the top right picture. You see that classic ring in your yard. Even sometimes when you're looking out on your lawn, you can see around the edges 
what looks like a little smoky, dusty, silvery dust. Um, that is the fungus itself. And <clears throat> they typically spread in a circular fashion. Think about the mushrooms that grow in your yard. What do they do? They produce a fairy ring, right? And so these fungal diseases do the same thing. They'll produce generally a circular um, pattern um, and will really do um, appear mostly in our wet seasons. So that also goes back to the watering in the winter. One of the reasons, well, two of the reasons why we don't water in the winter is number one, the grass is dormant. I mean, that, that is what grass does. We, we always try to keep it green, you know, 365 days of the year. And while we have a great and very nice long growing season, um, it does go dormant. So allow it to go dormant. And so the second reason you don't want to, um, to water in the wintertime is because we typically have um, much more humid days, maybe a little bit more rain. And um, that in combination with the, any watering you might do, you might have issues with these um, fungal diseases really taking hold. I know in our yard, we have a very, very slightly low area. And so over the past two or three years, we've been fighting a little bit of brown patch in that area. But what I've been doing is very slowly um, adding a little bit of sand and silt to that so that it will um, eventually fill in that spot. And I've actually noticed over the last um, couple of years that it's gotten smaller. So a lot of times you just have to mitigate the disease by not necessarily applying a fungicide, but just rectifying the problem itself. So be mindful of that. The other one is take all root, which really just destroys the grass. Um, it actually um, will, will completely rot the root itself. And, um, and you can tell because you can, just pull, you can just pull the grass right up out of the ground. Uh, it just separates from its roots. Um, this is a pretty serious disease. Um, it's for St. Augustine and Bermuda grasses. And it's fairly active in the humid um, climates, but typically could be any time of the year. And we definitely live in a humid climate here. So just be mindful of these. Um, they're, um, the brown patch is definitely treatable. And again, if you rectify any issues with standing water, um, and if it's a, a, a big area of standing water, turn it into a garden, which I'll show you how to do in just a second. All right, so with all that said, <clears throat> maybe you just want to throw your hands up and say, okay, well, then I give up. Um, rather than have a lawn, can I do something else? You absolutely can. There are many, many alternatives to lawns. I will tell you this, that in the state of Texas, homeowners associations are pretty powerful, um, to say the least. And um, a lot of times they will require that your, your front lawn or any visible portion of your property be covered in a lawn grass. Sometimes they even specify which type of lawn grass. Um, and they also sometimes have requirements about the percent coverage so you might have to have 75, 80, 90 percent coverage in your yard. Um, so be sure you check those out. Um, they often will limit or ban the use of any ornaments or hardscapes or water features. So before you go to any expense to try to um, install anything in your front yard, be sure that you um, understand what your homeowners association will allow. They also sometimes have height limitations. So if you want to put in a little fenced area or something cute like that, you may need to check to make sure that there are no limits to how high or how large an object can be in your front yard. Um, the picture there that you see is actually our backyard, uh, one of these beautiful, um, sweet, rainy days that we had. And you'll see that um, a good portion of it, at least next to the house, um, is in solid um, limestone patio. Um, it has its good and bad. You can see it's quite moldy there, quite mildewy in that picture. And then from the edge of that patio back to the fence, it's all mulched in. And I don't know how well you can see, but we have both bedding plants um, around the tree, and then we have lots of plants and containers. So we also practice um, this alternative um, lawn in our own home. All right, so let's, we're going to look at a few uh, rather quickly. You're mainly going to see pictures. Uh, with just a little bit of discussion, but we're going to look at some alternative plants, um, some different types of planted gardens, water features, um, some good materials that we can use, both natural and um, man-made materials. So let's look at ground covers. Um, if you were um, on a presentation that Paul did recently, um, 
Um, he did one about um, plants a few, maybe a week or so ago. And uh, I think he discussed maybe some of these ground covers, but you could certainly uh, replace your lawn with ground covers. Um, you see the Alternanthera um, Little Ruby is a Texas star plant, a beautiful, um, lush, um, very colorful ground cover that can provide a lot of, um, a lot of, that can cover a lot of space in your yard. And we're not necessarily saying that you have to just completely tear off the whole lawn, but if you want to reduce the amount of mowing, the amount of water that you're going to need, um, the amount of care and dedication it's going to take, some of these ground covers are quite easy to maintain and are less, um, you know, just less stressful to, to deal with. Um, there's another one there, the Trailing Lantana, which I've actually seen it in a number of colors. I've seen gold, I've seen lavender, purple, white, um, and they are very nice. Now, they may exceed some of the height requirements um, in your particular area um, based on your homeowners association requirements, but certainly you can fill a large area with that beautiful Lantana. We also have a Lobularia called White Stream. It's also a Texas Superstar plant. Um, and it makes just a lovely little white carpet. Um, and so if you want to do um, anything to reduce the amount of lawn that you need to maintain, these are some very, very suitable alternatives. And there are many others. People use ivies and uh, creeping jennies and all kinds of ground cover um, in their yards in this area. Another way is to just plant up part of your yard. Um, we've got a couple ideas here. Um, maybe have an herb garden if you're into culinary or aromatherapies or just want to have the beauty of an herb garden in your yard, there's certainly ways um, to do that. Another one is a native plant garden, which I think is a very effective use of your lawn space. Um, these plants are well suited to this area. They're natives here. Um, they will require a little bit less maintenance, certainly a lot of less, um, typically a lot less water and will really live up to the high humidity and high heat in our area. So you see there, I see in that picture maybe Texas sage, I also see mountain laurel and a few other plants in the native plant garden. So consider doing that in a portion of your yard. Pollinators are great, especially if you want to have an edible garden next to it. Um, you might want to have a pollinator garden to, to draw in the pollinators. Um, I know I um, have a few blueberry uh, plants in our backyard and I like having the pollinators in the yard for that very reason so we can have um, more fruit. So pollinator gardens are great. The kids love them because they attract all kinds of beautiful butterflies and birds and bees. And um, even I grow um, the voodoo lily. And so I even attract flies sometimes as a pollinator. Who knew a fly could be a pollinator, right? Um, and then finally, the edible gardens are exactly what they say. You see those beautiful um, uh, chard in, in those pictures there. Any number of plants are really lovely um, in the garden that, and that can be used for food. I mean, if you think about the turf itself, what does it really provide to us? Do you know that it's one of the largest agricultural crops that's not, I mean, largest crops that's not grown for um, food? I mean, we grow this beautiful grass, but we can't really eat it. I don't know about you, but I haven't had a Bermuda grass salad in a very long time. Um, other options for alternatives would be things like ponds, any kind of water features, bird baths, bogs, rain gardens. We do have another spot in our front yard that um, tends to be really low. Uh, there was actually somewhat of a collapse um, after water main broke and, and really dug out the area. And um, so it's always been really low. And rather than try to fight it and put turf there, we've made a rain garden. And I'm from South Louisiana, so of course I'm growing Louisiana irises um, in my rain garden. But a water feature is also a very lovely um, item to add to your yard as an alternative. You can also use natural materials to cover up some of the surface. Um, great hardwood mulches um, out there are being produced. I'm not a fan of dyed mulches. I'm not saying don't use them or you can't use them. I'm just not a fan of them. I like, I like my landscape to be much more natural looking. I also am a little concerned about what might leach out um, of those dyed mulches. So I tend to stick with a good hardwood mulch. Um, leaf mold which essentially our backyard, because it has a very large oak tree, it's mostly just composted leaves with a little bit of mulch mixed in. Uh, makes a nice, um, a nice um, bed for your yard. Um, rocks, pebbles and stones are great. Any kind of decorative stones, flagstone, um, straw is a great alternative. 
Um, some of these natural materials don't last very long, but certainly um, they can be added to your lawn um, as, a, as an alternative. Uh, as far as wood products, um, you can do shavings, you can do natural tree trunk slices, you can do recycled lumber. I would be a little bit concerned with putting treated wood unless you really want it to be treated and you're using it specifically to hold up something um, because those treated uh, woods often have chemicals such as arsenic and creosols in them that can um, cause some additional damage. <clears throat> Here are just some examples of wood and stone uh, laid out in pathways. Um, again, reducing the amount of lawn that you have to maintain. This beautiful tree trunk slices, any kind of recycled lumber. I'm a real, I'm real big fan of recycling and reusing as much as possible. And then you've seen the dry riverbed, which makes a nice pathway. Again, if you're going to try to grow Bermuda grass and you need to have a pathway, then go ahead and make it a great, nice, permeable pathway so that um, the water can permeate through those and you're not going to be fighting the issue with um, traffic on the St. Augustine. Well, any kind of rocks and gravels are nice. The thing about these, they're all permeable. And so again, we can get that rainwater to percolate down through the soil into the groundwater uh, rather than um, trying to tie it up and funnel it down to the street where it's going to go into the um, stormwater drains. There are some also um, manufactured or hardscapes that are certainly um, viable to be used as alternatives to lawns. We'll look at some of those. Uh, the first one is unsealed um, concrete pavers. Um, you see the one on the left there, just gravel filled concrete pavers. Again, it gives you um, a lot of coverage, a lot of durability in that coverage, and um, also it gives you the permeability for the water to travel through to the groundwater. The other one is a porous concrete paver. So although it's a solid material and real durable, it still has enough porosity that it will allow the water to drain through. Here are some manufactured pavers. Um, if, you've gone, if you go to one of my favorite um, nurseries in town um, at Wabash, they um, have these in, as their drive. And so they're extremely um, durable and also permeable. So again, you allow the water to roll through. But if you wanted to, you could do pathways using this material. In fact, I think we're going to probably purchase some of these um, to fix a little pathway issue we have in the backyard. Other um, pavers include planted pavers. So you can take those same pavers that were filled with gravel and plant them up. You see here some of these have some um, little low, very low growing plants in them. Or um, the one there in the, on the right is looks like maybe a little herb garden set up. Um, but any kind of low maintenance paver um, would be also a great alternative. And then creative pavers. I mean, let's face it, <clears throat> I love recycling materials and I'm a collector, so I like to collect um, items and reuse them in my home and reuse them in my arts and crafts projects. So why not reuse them in the yard? You see the one on the left are, are reused glass bottles. Now, I don't know how durable that would be. Those look pretty solid to me and look like they've been well worn. So maybe uh, that will work. You see the one on the right looks like just an eclectic collection of recycled bricks. Um, so just be creative with um, identifying different ways that you can um, change your turf out or part of your turf out to something that would be very aesthetically pleasing um, and also reduce the maintenance for you. So really in conclusion, <clears throat> recognize that although we have an obsession with lawn, it's really an investment in your property. And so I want you to be patient with your lawn. It's going to take time. If you're working on dealing with an issue or working on filling a gap in your yard, it's just going to take time. So be patient with your lawn. Be diligent with your lawn. You know, it's going to take care. It's going to take maintenance. It's going to take checking on those zones for the sprinklers pretty often. It's going to be adjusting them as the weather changes because, you know, we go from drought to like massive rain. Um, and so be diligent, be, be watching your lawn for the signs of weakness. Um, anytime you see the St. Augustine start to curl up, it's time to add a little water to it. And then lastly, be creative. Um, you know, use the, art, the artsy part of you um, and make your yard exciting, enjoyable for people to look at, enjoyable for you to look at. I tell you, one of the biggest thrills in my life having this property here is just watching the kids come. They run across the lawns and when they get to mine, it's like, oh, Miss Candy, your lawn is so soft. 
or they like to stop and look at the butterflies or stop and look at the lizards or collect snails or whatever's going on in my yard. Um, and so be creative and I encourage you to, um, to just have with your lawn, have fun with your lawn. All right, that's all I have. I want to thank you so much for your, um, your diligence and sticking with us and for trying out this new technology. Right. Here are the genius. great um, AgriLife um, in Texas A&M University websites. And with that, I appreciate your attention. I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. Okay. Um, did we have any more questions we wanted to get to from the chat or did we kind of really run out of time? Candy, yes. I don't know. Um, I, think we're, I think we're doing all right. One of the last questions uh -huh. that I saw was about live oaks, but you know, when you have live oaks in grass, I mean, established live oaks, they're just, they're, those are just two things that don't go, go together. Um, some people will spend years trying to fight it, and for a while they may think that they've won, but ultimately that tree's going to win because that tree's just going to suck every amount of moisture um, away from there. Well, and so, I, I do have a story about that quickly. Um, we have just a suburban yard here in Katy, and our front yard, we had two oak trees that we planted. We've been here 38 years, so they're 30-plus years old. And we were having issues with the, with the, the shade being too dense and struggling with keeping the, the turf healthy and, and aggressively growing. Um, so we finally took one down because, as you know, no suburban yard needs two live oaks. And um, even just, we did that about a year ago, and I'm telling you, the grass looks gorgeous right now. So keep if you keep them trimmed up, um, not ugly up, but trimmed up a little bit, um, and you don't have too many other uh, factors that would 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 um, prevent the sunlight from getting in under that tree. It's definitely manageable, but um, you know, put put a few containers around your oak tree if it starts getting a little bare. You know, just be creative. All right, Candy. Yeah, that sounds like um, most everybody's that we got. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to thank everybody so much for joining us. I'll put my camera back on. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have quite a few more uh, Master Gardener programs and just summer reading programs every day, all week long. We're doing things even on Saturdays. The best way to find out anything about our programming is to go to our Facebook page or our homepage. We have links to all of our, all of our events. Sometimes they're on Facebook, sometimes they're on Teams, sometimes they'll just be on YouTube. Um, so we're doing a variety of different programming and we're testing out the different modules where we're at. Uh, I got one last question. Do you have any recommendation for perennial long grasses? So I figured I'll, I'll shout that one out for you guys. Perennial, what kind of grasses? Long. Oh, long. L-O-N-G, I mean, sorry, long. I don't, I don't have any other suggestions really than the three that were given to us. Um, okay. You know, yeah. the same, obviously, um, I mean, you can over you can oversee with a little bit of rye if you want to do that for the winter time, but um, it's not. I don't know of any real others. I mean, buffalo grass can grow well in other parts of Texas. I'm not sure about how well it does here. Um, Paul, do you have any um, thoughts? Is, are, um, is the, I was just going to ask: Is the question more for or um, ornamental grasses? He said perennial grassy weeds as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm the last person you want to guess at what people are asking about for plants. <laughs> so I will leave it to you guys to hopefully let me know if that's something that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I was the one asking the question. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I've got a, a yard that's about two years old, and uh, I've been having problems with the perennial grassy weeds or perennial long grasses uh, kind of taking over and, and uh, killing off the Bermuda. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm just not sure what to do about them uh, other than, I mean, digging them up and replanting sod, which we've done in a couple of locations. Mm -hmm. All right. I know one of the thing, one of the things for sure, I'm guessing you're talking about things like crabgrass and Johnson grass that comes up. Uh, one of the things for sure is you want to keep those things mowed completely down. If they go to sea, it's going to be a losing battle. I know I watched my blessed neighbor across the street and she's fighting them right now, but 
she doesn't mow more often enough. And so they go to seed. And so she's constantly fighting them. So that's one thing you can do. Number two, short of digging, getting out there and digging them up. I don't really know of any, um, any specific herbicide because when you're dealing with grasses, they're all going to kind of respond the same way. And you don't want to kill any of your, any of your, the grass that you want to keep. So Paul, one, do you have any quick ideas? Uh, yeah, I'm looking at my list right now. Um, you know, Fertilome has a product called Weed Free Zone. Um, let me see who else. Uh, Bonide, Bo Bonide has Weed Beater for Southern Lawns, and it usually will cover both um, grassy type weeds and broadleaf weeds. Um, so um, you, you really just, uh, uh, what I would recommend is possibly go into a, uh, a retail independent garden center, um, talk with them um, but I think the main thing is if you have them don't load don't let them go to seed um, keep them mowed and usually what happens with uh, good cultural practices your turf will end up outgrowing the weeds and um, you know it's going to take some time it's not going to happen overnight but um, you got to be uh, a little aggressive with your your cultural practices and the uh, uh, if it's St. Augustine the St. Augustine will will overtake that, uh, those weedy grasses uh, in time. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, and, <laughs> and the problem, we're gonna constantly get lots of, lots of questions. So this is absolutely the last question because we have to let our, our, our guests go. Um, how often would you recommend to mow the, the lot to discourage the long grasses? Um, uh, Burr grasses are in the lawn is, is what um, Kristen is, uh, Kirsten is saying. Well, again, um, you, you want you want to you just want to get them mowed down before they go to seed. So, really, as soon as you see them, you need to you need to make sure you're keeping the lawn mowed. And the once a week program is going to take care of that. Um, I think it's about consistency. My neighbor's issue is that she doesn't have the mowers come in often enough, and so it does allow those uh, those weeds those weed grasses to go to seed. So the once a week diligently, and again, like um, Paul said, and I've iterated as well, keeping a healthy lawn will eventually eradicate those. But it's a struggle. It's a struggle. We all face it. I dig up a few every, almost every year. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think that was great. Uh, again, I thank you um, so much for joining us this evening. Thank you to all of our participants. Please don't forget to sign up for summer reading. Adults can sign up too. We want uh, everyone to read books throughout the summer. Uh, we're uh, open for curbside, so if you have any questions about curbside or the library, um, best place to do it is to, you can either message us on Facebook or call your local branch tomorrow. They should all be open um, something like 10 to 10 to 6 or so, are, are the hours, I believe, for curbside, and they can kind of answer all of your library questions. Um, so thank you again, everybody, um, and that is our program for this evening, so thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. And, and now is the awkward time of the program where I have to share with everybody that um, I can't shut down the program until everybody leaves. So <laughs> that's what we have. Ah, there we go. Uh, everyone can speak. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Bye. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I, seems like a great program. Okay. For anybody who's left, I apologize, but I'm going to start removing just so we can shut down the meeting and uh, have it closed down. So thank you for joining us.